So um, when Linda asked me to talk today, actually, she said, I want you to come teach the class about loans. And I said, but I, I don't do that. <laughs> I don't talk about loans. Anyway, I don't talk about grass. I talk about getting rid of grass. Or I don't talk about loans. I talk about getting rid of loans. She says, that's OK. And it sort of cracked me up because several years ago, I'm trying to remember, not the last time or the time before I, I did this particular class, um, Dave Shaw, who at the time was still working for Cooperative Extension and, and was the turf grass expert, they invited me to come talk about turf grass in the morning and me to come talk about getting rid of one. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that with, I think they expected to see sparks flying. And it was really funny because I came in, I saw Dave, gave him a big hug, and everybody thought we were going to be like doing this. And we're really good friends. And, and as he sat in on my presentation, you know, I threw it back and forth to him, so that was really fun. So I, I, we're going to, we're going to talk about getting rid of lawn. Okay. So as master gardeners, you guys have a huge responsibility, as you know, you're learning, right, to interface with the public, give <coughs> them accurate information, and um, to help them to hold their hands, because people really want to do the right thing. Sometimes they don't have a clue as to what that is, as you are obviously learning as well, and so. Um, what I want to do is, I, again, I'm going to talk, we're going to talk about how to get rid of lawn. We're, I'm going to broke, I broke this up in two sections. First, we're going to talk about how to get rid of lawn, and then we're going to talk about some of the lawn replacements. And, and the, it's mostly about how to get rid of lawn, but how, some lawn replacements, and I brought some plants to share as well, so you can see some of those too. <clears throat> so when you get a call, or somebody comes up to you at an event, and they say, oh, I need to get rid of my lawn. What do I do? I want to encourage you to first ask them some questions because you're going to be able to answer, respond to them best the more you know about what their needs are. So first I want you to ask them, are they landlords or are they homeowners? <laughs> <laughs> or renters? Most often it's the landlords or the homeowners. Are they talking about residential or commercial? Are they experienced gardeners or are they Beginners. Mostly they're going to be beginners. Um, why do they want to get rid of their grass? What are they thinking about replacing it with? If I go too fast, just let me know. And by the way, if you have questions, go ahead and ask me. Um, <clears throat> how far along in the process are they? So often people will get a hold of me and say, you know, I, I've tried this and this and this and this, and I don't know what I'm doing, blah, blah, blah. Figure out where they are in that process. Um, what methods have they tried, if they've already tried? Where have they tried? What time of year did they do it? Hmm. Really important to know. Um, and how did it work? What was successful and what wasn't successful? Then you want to know, you know, they have specific questions. Are they just looking for someone to hold their hand and be assured that they're, they're doing the right thing, et cetera, et cetera. So that's what I'm going to talk about first. And I expect we'll get partway through that discussion before I get that sign that says, great job. So <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not saying that to be like egotistical. That's what the sign says. <laughs> so why are we concerned about lawns? I'm, I'm assuming this is going to be re a re repeat for you guys, but you can never hear this often enough. We live, of course, in, over here, in this Mediterranean climate. Five Mediterranean climate regions of the world, the west coast of California, the Mediterranean basin, which is where the name comes from, the west coast of Chile, the tip of South Africa, which by the way, I think we're going to do a trip there in November, and then southwestern and southern Australia, where I think we're going to go in 2017. That's the plan at the moment. So the equator is right here. And what you notice if you get closer is that these regions, these are bands across the same equidistance from the equator. It's about 30 to 40 degrees north and south. And this is, these are both a special kind of subtropical region. It's an arid subtropical region. I had someone say to me once, oh, those are where all the good grapes come from and the good wines. And that's true, right? We, uh, and the reason that, that we talk about these regions and why they are considered to be Mediterranean climates is because of the climate pattern. The climate pattern which we all know and the fear are changing, but hopefully not too much, is that 
we get all our rainfall between November and I always say March, but there was a woman on the news the other night that said we all we often get three quarters of an inch of rain in April. I was really surprised. She was one of the um, meteorologists, so I'm going to adjust that. March and April. I mean, sorry, November and April. And we tend to have milder winters, and then from April until November again, there's virtually no rainfall. Sometimes we, because we're so far south, we get a little bit of the tropical storms coming up from Mexico, but we basically get almost nothing. That's a long, hot, dry period. Great for plants, I mean, great for people. That's why people want to come live here, right? Beautiful, warm, sunny summers. Not so easy if you're a plant. Because if you, how many of you are from outside of California originally? So interesting. I used to say this and all the arms went up. And more and more, you know, we're, we're, we're at, the, at a point in time where many of us are actually born and raised here. But um, if you're from those other parts of the world, you know, anywhere other than these regions, you get rainfall in the summer when it's warm. So the plants that are evolved for those climates are plants that have big, beautiful green leaves. Remember, the, the leaves are the solar collectors, right? That's how you get the sun for solar photosynthesis. So those leaves are, are out there collecting the sunlight so those plants can grow. And when you go to other parts of the country, other parts of the world, you see plants that have these big, big trees, shrubs, big, beautiful leaves. In those climates, most of those climates, the harshest time of year is winter. And so what happens is that the trees go into dormancy in winter to get through the cold. And they kind of stand there in suspended animation. They drop all their leaves. They're waiting for it to warm up. And those leaves accumulate a beautiful, nice, rich layer of organic matter in the soils. Those people come here and they look at our soils and they go, what the heck is this? I see not, right? Because when you look at our <coughs> plants, they're adapted to surviving the heat and the drought at the same time. So all of their adaptations are ways to conserve water. So a lot of our native plants, you know, look at our hillsides in the summer, the native, it looks brown, right? Because a lot of the native plants go dormant. They look dead. In fact, there was just a discussion on, on San Diego Gardner. I think it was the San Diego Gardner Facebook group about somebody saying that they had some beautiful natives and their neighbor cut them down, not realizing they weren't dead. And now they're having this big argument, you know, education <laughs> with their neighbor. But a lot of our plants, look, they just turn brown. They just go completely to sleep in the summertime. A lot of them have very, very, very tiny leaves because the idea is to conserve water. You're balancing the amount you need to photosynthesize with the minimal amount of surface area, because the more surface area you have, the more water you lose into the atmosphere. So where do we have plants with big leaves? Think about it, the sycamores. Where do they live in riparian habitats? Basically, everything else has a very small leaf or a leathery leaf that doesn't have much water in it. The succulent, so it accumulates water when there's water around, but it can survive the, the long, dry periods. Waxy leaves, because the wax seals the water in. What else do we have? Plants whose leaves are at an angle like this. Because if you're like this, you're getting sun full on. But if your leaves are more like this, then you can control the amount of sunlight and, and protect yourself. OK, I'm giving plants you know, human characteristics. They don't have that. That's what I'm talking about. So when you look at the plants in all these regions, which is part of why I like to travel to <coughs> these parts of the world, you see the same adaptations. Even though we are the driest, of the Mediterranean climates, and not just in drought times. I mean, we get the lowest volume of rainfall here. It doesn't matter. It's that pattern when the rain falls, when the snow comes, that makes the difference. So when we look to plants that are adapted to our region, naturally adapted, these are the places we look. Fortunate for us, these are the regions of the world that are the most biodiverse. <laughs> Unfortunately, and they're also the ones that develop at the most rapid pace because people like to live there. So, kind of give you some context for, for where we are. Any questions? Did you all know that already? No. You kind of did. All right. So, we have those poor soils. Poor. They're appropriate for us, but they're poor for other reasons in the world. And our water is really, really precious. In fact, 
in this region, this is changing a little, but 80% of the water in our area comes from way outside of our area. In fact, we did a show last season called How Water Flows because I wanted people to see how far water comes and how much work it takes to get it to our farms and gardens. We went up to Lake Oroville, which is where all of the snow melts from the Sierra Nevadas, collects up in Lake Oroville. I didn't bring the picture, but when we were there a year ago, it was like just the bounce of it. There was, it was terrifying. I'd been there before when it was like, you know, normal. And this was, we were down in the mud in the bottom. Wow. Mm -hmm. So Lake Oroville, and it comes all the way down, that wonderful series of canals and aqueducts, et cetera. Colorado River, we went out to Blythe, and we, we went to Lake Havasu as well to, to see how water comes from here. Hundreds of miles, hundreds of miles to get to here. And even though San Diego has been diversifying its sources of water, creating more storage, adding the, the um, desal plant, which doesn't produce all that much water, I think it's only 17% of what our ultimate need is, the energy it takes, the effort it takes, the habitat that gets destroyed in the process, you know, we shouldn't be doing what we're doing. I mean, that's kind of the bottom line, but we're doing it. So, um, as you know, we're in year five in drought. It's not our first drought. I've lived through many of them in my lifetime. It's the one I'm most aware of and concerned about because with global warming, what we're going to see <coughs> is over time, it's just going to get hotter and drier and less rainfall. So, not to be doomsday. Um, <laughs> and, and the way we use water, it used to be that most of the water that we use as residents, not commercial and not agriculture, but residentially, most of the water was used inside. And then in the 90s, we had those wonderful programs with the low flush toilets. We finally got the kinks worked out. You know, it only took 20 years. Um, low flow shower heads, you know, the low flow on your, on your faucets, to the point where that we conserve so much that now most of the water we use is outside. More than 50% of the water we use is outside. Most of that, guess where it goes? Grass. Lawns. I shouldn't say grass, I should say lawns. It's the biggest opportunity. I just have to tell you, this is funny. A couple of years ago, I was teaching a class at the Water Conservation Garden. And I was talking about this and about irrigation systems, whatever. And some woman sitting in the front row was so confused. And finally, she raised her hand and she said, why do I need an irrigation system? And the whole class looked at her like, what? She had just moved from upstate New York. Uh -huh. She had never had an irrigation system. She couldn't imagine why you needed one. And we, we just all looked at her and said, just wait. <laughs> so, used to be when I started talking about rid getting rid of lawns, people thought I was crazy. So here's a really good little demonstration of why I can do this and put it up on the table where you can all see it. You know Mark Wisniewski? Anybody know Mark? He is an arborist in town. He's a really smart guy. He made this for me a couple of years ago. This is my Wisniewski stick. I say that three times fast. This is an indicator of why lawn is so problematic. Can you see in the back? See this? This is grass down here. It's painted. Let me walk it down the so you can just get a, a glimpse of what they look like. The green at the bottom and the blue all the way to the top. You see that? Yeah. So the green is grass. Okay. The, this line here, you know, there should be a line about right here. I'm not saying. A line about right here would be the amount of rain that we get. Right? Ten inches, at least in theory. Ten inches of rain is what it takes what we have to support that grass. But that's not enough. If you live in Torrey Pines area, you need this much water to support that much grass. Mm -hmm. And if you live in Escondido, you need to water this much to support that much grass. Okay? It gives you a visual on how much water it actually takes. Why does it take more in Escondido? Anybody? Water and dryer, exactly. That's right. So it's, it's the, you know, replacing the water that's lost to the air through evapotranspiration. 
Everybody knows that term, right? <laughs> so that really, I mean, that's kind of shocking, don't you think? You have to apply this much water. I'm five foot three. three. Yes. Can you convert that into kind of a how many Inches? gallons of water per square foot of grass? There are calculations, and I don't have it off the top of my head. But I, if you remind me, if you send me an email, my email should be at the bottom of the handout. I will find that for you. Is that per year? Per year, yes. Per year. So that's how much extra we have to add. That lives in my garage. Um, <laughs> so, drought. Cash for grass, yes. So if you were to um, go back to your stick, yes. if you were to plant a drought resistant uh, area instead of a lawn, yes. like how much water would you guess it would take to water that as opposed to lawn? So, okay, how much water would it take if you had a drought resistant garden rather than lawn? It's not a straightforward answer because a water wise garden is a system and it depends on how you put it together. Mm -hmm. You have to have the right kind of soil. You have to have the right, you know, the soil is appropriate. You have to have the right really irrigation well done, system. Like one that you would say is a model. Well, ideally, yeah. zero. Ideally, you would have a landscape that needed no supplemental water after it was established. Um, in in truth, there are actually there are probably a whole lot of gardens that could be turned off, and people are afraid to do it. They just don't. They just can't adjust to the idea that they could do that. My own garden doesn't get watered at all from you know, November through April, unless we have one of those hot, long, dry periods. Um, and then it's on a smart controller now, so I'm not controlling it, but when I was controlling it, the thing is about these plants is they really, if you're using the right plants, they really don't want to be watered in the summer. So if you get enough winter rainfall, you really don't want to do much, especially if you have like the proteaceous plants, the, the pin cushions, the grevilleas, the leucodendrons, the cone bushes, etc. When you water them, you lose them. And a lot of the natives too, because when in warm, wet soil, you have a proliferation of Phytophthora and other different kinds of fungi and things like that, and the roots are really susceptible to those. And so invariably, if somebody says to me, oh, I have a grevillea or I have a pink cushion or whatever, and I just lost it, just died like that, I'll say, was it in August? And they look at me like I'm a magician. Because it's almost always August, sometimes September. Because that's when those problems happen. So you really don't want water. If you, I know we look at it and we think, oh my god, I haven't watered, everything looks sad. But you really want to refrain from watering. Okay. I don't want to get too far off topic here. All right. So let's talk about why we're concerned, concerned about lawns. Lawns take a huge amount of resources. Think about it. There is really nothing in your garden that needs to be watered as often, fertilized as often, pruned as often. Isn't mowing pruning? You use power tools, so you're generating carbon dioxide. You've got the clippings, and if you leave the clippings on the grass, it's fine, but most people don't. They gather them up, they stick them in the greenways. Big trucks get them, take them to the, the composting facility, hopefully. Big machines compost it. Then you hire a truck to bring it back to you, <laughs> right? Or you drive it. And so you're, you're just, it's just a huge input of resources. So, if you get rid of your lawn, you lose most of that. We have issues with runoff. Okay, so you know that lawn, that streets don't grow, right? We don't have <laughs> But when you see this, you know, it reminds us that we have huge issues with runoff. And those fertilizers and those pesticides are a major contributor to the pollution that goes into our waterways. So if you can the great thing about waterways gardens. You don't have to fertilize. And the maintenance is minimal. So you're not generating the green waste and you don't have as much issue with, with adding pollution to the waste stream because you just don't use those materials. And of course, because you're watering only enough for it to go into ground, you don't have runoff. So we know we're, we're working towards this major urbanization in this area. There's a, 
uh, statistic I've seen across resources, is that the regional growth forecast for 2030 suggests that almost all of our current agricultural land will be developed. Our open space will be reduced by 33% from the 2007 levels. And what that means is we're going to have more hard surfaces, more houses, everybody's shaking their head, I know. It's like, it's totally depressing, I'm sorry. We're going to have more houses, more streets, more hard surfaces for water to run off. And of course, that leads us into a whole discussion about permeability. We're not going to go there. You know, in other words, water permeability and using permeable surface. So I don't want to go there, but it's something to think about. So we do have to think about that, especially if this concerns uh, fertilizers and pesticides, again, most of which gets used a lot. And to be honest with you, when you ask people why they have lawn, they have no clue. It's just default. You know, if you think about it, most people, well, they have a space, they don't know what else to plant. They don't know about, well, not plumbago, because I agree with that, but they don't know about, about the wonderful, beautiful plants that are out there that are water-wise, that are easy, easy to take care of. They just go off to Home Depot and buy a couple of rows of sod and roll it out, it's green carpet, and they're done. It's our job to educate people as to why that's a problem. The only really good reason to have grass, in my opinion, of course, you're getting my opinion, the whole, everything's my opinion, now, <laughs> is when it's a shared space, when it's a used space, right? Parks, community centers, places where people come together and use it. I think of Mala now as I think about swimming pools. Sure, you could have one, but how much is it going to get used? Really what we should be doing and what they do in other parts of the country so well is they have those as shared use facilities. That makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. So let's talk a little bit about history. Um, our show on how to get rid of lawns, we go through this. It's really cool. We talked to this guy who is an environmental historian who specializes in water policy issues at Pomona College, and he is the coolest person. His name is Char Miller. In fact, his name is cool. Char, he's the fourth in his family to be named Frank, and his parents had spent time in India, and evidently Char is Hindi for the fourth. So mm -hmm. his oh, yeah. name is Char, right? Yeah. You know that? Yeah. How do, how do you know that? It's greeting Char. I used to speak it. <laughs> there you go. So here is what our region looks like. This is what it looked like. Okay, these are pictures of what our natural landscape looked like. See lawn there? Pretty bleak. Pretty bleak. We didn't get lawn in San Diego, in Southern California, until the Victorian era. Anyone want to guess why in the Victorian era? Any ideas? <laughs> yeah, that's what they wanted, but they couldn't do it before because hoses and sprinklers were invented in this era. Okay, before that, how did you get water? You had a comment? No, I just want to. Could you speak just a little bit louder? Yes, thank you. Maybe I'll move this a little bit closer. Is that better? Is yes. that better? No? Okay. Um, so hoses and sprinklers were invented in the late 1800s, and that made it possible to bring water to, to bring water into landscapes. And so the Victorians were really big on grass. In fact, I was reading some history, and one of the ways that they evaluated or determined the gentility of a neighborhood was by how many lawns there were. Right? And remember, they were incredible plants people. They collected plants, that's how they were able to do it. So that's where those wonderful Victorian flower beds came into being because they started to you know, have a way of watering plants. And then, of course, how many of you went to school in California, in Southern California? So do you remember learning this? I remember learning about Mr. Mulholland. And how wonderful it was when the water came. I grew up in the San Fernando Valley. And whenever we were up the brake line, we would see you know, a big flume coming down. And we were so excited. Little did we know. <laughs> Little did we know. So the LA Aqueduct 
the whole state water system, starting at about the early teens and into the 20s, brought all the water to Southern California. We had no clue. You know, the, the way it was marketed, we thought we had all the water in the world, and, and we did, at least in those days. But did you know that the last time San Diego's population was small enough to live on the natural water sources we have, or have been? 1940s. Wow. 1940s. Okay. So, thank you, Mr. Mulholland, for the lovely dream that lasted for a while. Yes? What was the population then? I have looked it up before. It was something like 40,000. Maybe it's a little bit bigger than that. It was 30,000 at the time of the 1915 uh, Panama American Exposition. So, this is about the same time. So it was like 30 or 40, oh, sorry, in 1940s it would have been a little bit more, so maybe about 50,000, something like that. And then of course, after the boys came home and suburbia landed in Southern California, every home had a lawn. So that's kind, of, that's kind of how we got to where we are today. Now, when I was talking to this guy at Cal Poly Pomona, I'm oh, no, sorry, not Cal Poly Pomona, Pomona College. We were also at Cal Poly Pomona this season, so I, I, my brain starts going off different directions. Um, this guy is, it was really interesting, and one of the things he said to me was that lawn is considered to be, the arrival of lawn in California is considered to be the major, the major landscape transition uh, that the state ever saw. And I said to him, and, and he, the things that I talk about, turns out they're teaching. I was blown away by that. It's like, oh, this is in the university now. How cool is that? And as we were talking, I said, you know, I feel like we are in the midst, in the beginning stages of this, an equally important transition in the exact opposite direction. Mm -hmm. Don't you feel like that? Yes. 50 years from now, <laughs> people are going to look back at where we are right now and say, look at how they change things the way it should have been. And you guys are part of that. All right, so grasses. Let's go back to what we're talking about. If you feel the need to identify grasses, there's some great online resources. <laughs> now that's important if you're putting a lawn in. If you're taking a lawn out, this is not going to help you at all. What matters is the kind of roots that the grasses have. So when someone calls the hotline, or you're at a, an event, you're still doing the hotline, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Because yes. I, I send people to the hotline all the time. Um, and they start talking about their grass and want to get rid of it. The first question is, other than those other ones I just told you about, what do the roots look like on your grass? You see how in this picture, this turf has these fine thread-like roots? See that? These kinds of grasses are really easy to get rid of because you kill the blades of the top, which is what photosynthesizes and feeds the plants. There's nothing to support the roots. They're gone. It'll take you a little bit of work. But you kill the top, the bottom dies. On the other hand, <laughs> dramatic pause. Yeah. Okay. On the other hand, most people have grasses that have these thick, fleshy roots. These are actually stolons. They, they're stems that crawl along the ground. And I like to describe these to people as looking a little bit like what comes out of a potato when you leave it in the drawer too long. <laughs> Not exactly, but more like that. Now what happens is that these grasses store energy in those thick, fleshy roots. And when you break these up, each of these little points here, these little joint areas, is a node. So when you break it up, it roots and it makes another plant, and we'll talk about that more in a few minutes. This is the stuff that's hard to get rid of. Because, and you know it mostly probably is Bermuda grass. This, I'll talk about the methods, but this, 
is the hardest thing to get rid of. And this is up there with, with uh, equisetum, you know, the horsetail rush, and ivy. I think it's even harder than ivy. The first house we had in San Diego that we bought in, up in Encinitas when we moved here in 1986, yikes, that's a long time ago, um, had a vegetable garden that had been let go. And so my, we came here for my husband's job, so I wasn't working right away. And I thought, well, I have to have a garden. I'm going to dig out all the Bermuda grass in that vegetable garden and do it. Dig it, right? Spent days digging and digging and digging and digging. Had sand, digging and digging and digging. And digging. There were times I went this deep and I never got to the tip of that Bermuda root. So the literature will tell you it goes, you know, six to eight inches down. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, yeah, we moved out of that house. <laughs> so that's kill grass. The, so the kinds of methods for killing grass. There's different methods, and so you want to talk with the, with the gardener, the person that you're talking to, about how much time they have, how much resources they're willing to invest, what they're going to replace the lawn with. Um, you know, how, how they feel about using chemicals in their gardens. How patient they are. Because you know, as gardeners, we all know this, patience is the key to success in any garden. It may not get you where you thought you were going, but it'll get you somewhere. <laughs> because there are some methods for getting rid of lawn, getting rid of grass, that will take a day or two. But, especially if you have Bermuda, it's going to take time, months, <coughs> a year. And you want people to be realistic about their expectations. So, methods. If you have that nice, you would hear me say this a bunch of times. If you have that nice, fine, yeah, the nice grass with the fine, red-like roots, you can turn the water off, right? Because the grass will just die. If you have reviewed grass, what happens? It goes dormant. It turns brown. And then it comes back, right? When the rains start, if you start watering, it just comes back, okay? And if people tell you, well, I turned the water off, make sure you ask them what kind of grass they had, because they might tell you they've killed their lawn, not realizing that they have Bermuda grass, and as soon as they start, you know, creating a new garden, it's all going to re-sprout. Okay, this is one of my favorite methods. This is what I call cover and smother. People call this sheet mulching. And it's a process that literally smothers the grass. This is somebody who took one of my classes a couple years ago and sent me, thank you, sent me photos over the course of her, her doing this. Now, this takes time, and of course it works best with the grasses that have fine thread-like roots. But you can do it with Bermuda. You might have to do multiple different, use multiple different methods, but you can use it with Bermuda. And so what you do, oh, this is this is just to give you an idea of how it looked. You want to cover, you want to cut the lawn really short. You want to water it really well. You want to cover it. We used to say with newspaper, but you know how the newspaper looks these days. Right? Cardboard, if you can get it it doesn't have much glue, and take the staples out, it's cardboard. Or you can buy a roll of brown paper, they call it craft paper, at the big box store, which is really easy to do because it comes in big long rolls, and you just roll it out and you cover the grass. You wet down the newspaper or the cardboard, and then you cover it in mulch. This thing, <coughs> six inches, eight inches, now, think about what happens when you meet up with the sidewalk and a curb. Six or eight inches of mulch at the edge of the sidewalk and a curb are not going to stay there on their own. So you have to dig out a trench along the edge, and you wrap the paper, you, you, you wrap the paper down into the trench, fill it with mulch, wrap it back, and then put some mulch on top, too. Some people I know call this the burrito method. But that's the best way to do it. And it's, it's really helpful not just to keep the mulch from falling onto the sidewalk or the curb or the, or the driveway, 
but also that's the hardest place to get rid of your grass. So you're adding that extra bit of dating it out. So you want to do that, and then you want to leave it. And, oh, you want to turn off your irrigation system too, right? Some people will, will make a hole in the mulch and the cardboard and the mulch and the newspapers where the pop-ups are. But I think it's a lot easier just to use an oscillating sprinkler. You know the one you used to run through when you were a kid and you were running through the sprinklers? Remember? One that goes back and forth on the end of your hose. And you want to set that up to go. And the reason you need to, that to happen is because what you're doing is you're getting the lawn, the grass, to compost in place. And part and it, the, 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 uh, the, the fungi and bacteria and all the little <coughs> microbes and stuff that, that do that decomposition process have to be wet. They need the moisture. So you do need to water this periodically, like water it really well throughout <coughs> the period of time that you're doing this, which it will take a couple months until you're ready to go. Yes, you see the cover the irrigation system. If you cover the irrigation system, if you cover your pop-ups or your sprinkle heads or whatever with this stuff, then you have to turn it off because you don't want it to try to turn it on and then water it with a hose and sprinkle. Okay. I think it's much easier than trying to figure out where each one is and making a hole and blah blah. Sounds like a nightmare. So after five or six weeks, if you dig down into the paper or the cardboard, this is what it should look like. Wow. And then you could replant right away. And you could literally move the stuff away, dig your hole, put your plant in the hole. The challenge is if you're going to do drip irrigation, you really want that under the mulch. So I have seen people put the drip irrigation in first. I've also seen people scrape away all this stuff, stockpile it through their landscape, put <coughs> the irrigation, put it back on. Why don't you want drip irrigation on top of mulch? Anybody? You got to you got to saturate the mulch then with water before the mulch gets to the soil, which is where the plant roots are. So you're not saving anything. And besides, drip irrigation is not necessarily nice to look at, so you want it under the mulch. So um, just to tell you, this is this woman's, this is her landscape again. Here's her lawn. Here's the mulch. Here's her replaced work. She started this in July. They did the the, uh, the demolition demolition and hardscape starting in August, August, September, October, November. <coughs> and this, oh, sorry, this is August, September, October, and this is hold hold it, sorry. This is July. This is September. So that's the process from grass to a new landscape. Okay, the next method we're going to talk about, and I think at, this, at that point we'll probably be ready for a break, right? Yes? Okay. Ten minutes, sorry. This is one of my favorite methods. Soil solarization. Anybody who's done this? How did it work? I was trying to do it over Bermuda grass. Okay, how do you work for you? Excellent. Excellent. Where do you live? Um, Belleville Park area. Okay. Anybody else try? Yeah. yeah. How do you live? Black instead of okay, we'll talk about that. Where do you live? Yes, yes. Mesa. Mesa. Okay. So soil sterilization is a technique that comes to us from Israel. And what's interesting about this is some guy, I don't know who it was, had greenhouses that were covered in plastic. <coughs> Summer came, they pulled the plastic off. It was an additional layer of protection. Pulled the plastic off, piled it up. The next year it was time to put the plastic back on. They looked at where they had piled up the plastic, <laughs> and everything was dead underneath it. And they went, oh, that's interesting. And so they developed this method. And it's essentially superheating the soil. So what you do is you need you know, your area of grass. And you want to use plastic. The best plastic is about two mils thick. Mill is a measurement of thickness. You can go with thicker, but the thinner actually works better. The challenge is the thinner, if you can find it that's UV stabilized, that's great. But the plastic will start to break down at some point. So if you can find UV stabilized, two mil or so is good, four mil is good. And you know, you just want to buy those big rolls of plastic that you find in usually in the paint department. And you want to spread it over the soil. Before you do that, like with, uh, with the cover and smother, 
you mow as low as possible, and you water. You want to get water as deep as you can. A couple of feet would be ideal. Because what really happens here is that the water heats up, and that heats the soil. Because water heats faster than soil does. The soil will eventually heat up, but water heats up faster than soil does. And what this does is it kills the grass, weed seeds, that's an added benefit, pathogens. It does kill some of the beneficials, but they do tend to rebound pretty quickly. It's very easy to do. You have to do it in the hottest months of summer. And if you live along the coast, it's going to take you longer. If you live inland, it should take about six to eight weeks. So, it will work for Bermuda that's not too deep, but with Bermuda, you often have to combine methods to really get rid of it. Okay, you spread out the plastic, and then you have to you want to go beyond the edges because wherever it edges is the, going to be the coolest area. Yes, there's no digging involved. No, nope. no digging. No digging. So it's always going to be cool. the, the least amount of heat accumulation is going to happen at the edge. So you see how the grass ends here, and then we pulled it past about this much just so that we made sure that the grass would heat up here as well as it does in the center. And then you have to weigh it down. You can see there's a piece of bamboo actually rolled into this. Bricks, rocks, whatever. You need to weigh it down. And if you have, if you have to do seams in the middle of your lawn, if your lawn's really big, then you need to use bricks or something to weigh it down there too. Of course, you need to turn off your irrigation system. What would happen if the pop-ups came up? That would be a big mess. Yeah. Okay. So here's what happens. This was some experimentation that was done in the Central Valley. If you do this in the heat of summer, at two inches, your soil can eat up eight to 14 degrees above air temperature. Up to, you know, in the Central Valley, they measure temperatures up to 140 degrees. At four inches deep, you get a heating of six to nine degrees. That doesn't seem like a lot to us, but if you're a grass, that could be deadly. Now the issue about black plastic, who said that? You did it. Okay. So look at this. Under black plastic, at four inches, you're at three degrees of heating as compared to six or nine. At two inches, you're at five degrees as compared to eight to 14. Here's a way to think about this. If you go to, if you go to the mall on a hot day, drive your car, park at the parking lot, Go inside, buy whatever you're going to buy, come back out with your arms full, put your key in, open the door, what happens? Hot as heck in there, right? <clears throat> if you tint your windows and, have, and do the same thing, what's the difference? It's a lot cooler. The black shades. The black is shading. It doesn't, what we're doing here is we're using the, the power of the sun and greenhouse effect. So we're capturing the solar radiation that cannot get back up, out through the plastic. And in fact, if you want to enhance the effect, what you do is you do two layers with a little bit of airspace in between. Okay? You can do that, it'll heat even more. But this is the greenhouse effect. We're capturing the heat. You walk into a greenhouse, what does it feel like inside? Nice and warm. If you shade it, what does it feel like inside? Nice and cool. So, even though the black plastic feels hot, the heat is not getting to the soil. Another question. Um, what if there's a tree in the middle of a yes. person's lawn? Yeah. If there's a tree there, what you want to do is you want to go only as far as the grass is and it's sunny. Okay, because in shade it won't work. Mm -hmm. So, you know, grass roots, you, in a regular tree, I'm sorry, tree roots rather, you really don't have to worry too much because you're not going to get that close to the tree and it's not going to be on there that long and the tree's got deep roots, so it's really not an issue. And if you have shrubs and, and things there, you might want to dig out the grass right under the shrubs and just go as close as you can. I've seen this done many times. I've never seen any damage to anything that's around it. The hardest thing is when you get to the edge of like a flower bed or whatever, the grass at the edge doesn't die because of the edge effects. So this can take, in the heat of summer, in La Mesa, or in, where did you say you live? Where did you live? I can't remember. Park. Park, right. So that's good. 
in the heat of summer, <coughs> six to eight weeks, you're done. You're done. You take the plastic off, it looks like straw. What I would do then is I would turn the water on. Because that's how you're going to figure out what you actually did kill and what you didn't kill. Right? And the same thing with the smother and cover method. You might get Bermuda popping up here and there over time as you start to irrigate. So I always like to do the irrigation ahead of time just to actually know what I've killed and what I haven't killed. Because what you don't want and what you don't want people to do is to invest in a whole new landscape. And then, like, have you, you know, do you ever watch those those one day makeover shows? Um, yeah. <laughs> Thank God they're not doing those anymore. Yeah. I haven't seen those in a long time. Because yeah. like, I, I used to get so irate. <laughs> the landscaper would come in, dig everything out, put in a new landscape, and they were all in LA, right? And it's like, we're all like here. Put a new landscape, ta-da, beautiful, everybody's crying, they're so happy, right? I want to go back three months later. Yeah. I'm sure they're crying, and not for the <laughs> <laughs> okay. Should we stop now or should I talk about one more minute? Two minutes? All right, this is really quick. You can always hire a really strong, handsome young man <laughs> to dig out your lawn. This is Paul Redeker. He was at the Water Conservation Garden. Now he's the horticulturist at San Diego Botanic Garden. But especially if you have the grass that has the nice, fine, thread like roots. Take it out. You can dig out Bermuda too, as I described. You may not get it all, but you can get a lot of it by just digging it. And to dig it, you want a flat edge shovel. You want to angle a little bit, because what you want to do is you want to get the roots, but you really don't want to get too much soil. One, because there's no need to, but two, because stuff gets really heavy, right? And what do you do with the stuff that you dug out? If there's no Bermuda in it, if, you can just literally turn it over in place and it will compost. Mm -hmm. Or you can move it off to the side and make a nice big pile and let it compost. But it's pretty darn straightforward. There just isn't that much to it. You might want to water ahead of time just because it might make it easier to get the shovel in. But that's about all. Okay, should we take a break? Okay, be back in 15 minutes, please.